Hello and welcome to another episode of The Scrivenery. Today we have a special guest host with us. Uh, I would go and introduce him, but I hope everyone listening who is viewing this channel knows the one, the only, Brendan LaSalle. Hello, thank you all for showing up and watching today. Great. How you do? How you doing, Ed? It's doing splendid. Can't complain. Fantastic. So you know we're starting to head into uh, <clears throat> into convention season here, and uh, we did actually do a uh, a sh uh, an entire episode where where Trevor and I focused on um, how to get the most out of using conventions for um promoting your products sure 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 but one of the things that we didn't really dive into too much uh is that and, and this isn't strictly a convention thing but it's one of the things that that can that can venn diagram overlap with convention is play testing mm. uh you know certainly we see uh this uh, conventions are a great opportunity to to play test because one of the things that you want to do with your product with respect to play testing is play testing with different gaming groups because every group is going to have a totally different approach to yes. uh you know one group is going to charge in uh damn the torpedoes another group is going to be ta you know investigate everything and so uh you one of the things that you want to do of course with play testing is how are different groups of people going to go at your product exactly. so today we're going to talk about <clears throat> And again, not just in the context of conventions, but playtesting, how to get the most out of playtesting. What are the different things that playtesting is going to serve for you? How do you, how do you arrange the process so as to facilitate having it serve those purposes for you? Me. All right. So let me put out a couple of things that I think just as top bullet points and see what you think about this. Absolutely. As uh, with respect to the primary, very high level 50,000 foot view, the primary reasons that you're play testing, I think most of it comes down to, um, uh, to, well, okay, three things really. Okay, I guess one is just very broadly speaking, is your product fun? Uh, because there's no point in having a game if it's just not enjoyable. Now, understanding that what's fun for one group of people is is going to be something that's that's just not cool for another group. You got to understand. You know, if you have, I've got a couple of uh, one or two modules that I've put out, for example, that are very role play intensive. And I even put in the notes on it, this is a heavy role play module. Because if what you're looking for is a hack and slash, then this isn't it. But anyway, <clears throat> is it something that at least some people are going to, to, to play and enjoy? Uh, then there's, what is the balance, the the balance of power? Does it Does it come out, you know, you've set it for second level, third level, first level, whatever. Does it come out well for that level? And then finally, time. Now, for a lot of cases, this may not matter too much. And uh, if you're the, if this is something that's intended to be for your gaming group, if it if it takes, you know, three sessions versus twelve, it's maybe not that big of a deal. But if it's something that you want to be intend to be a one shot, especially, then it becomes a very big issue of. Is this something that I'm intending to be four hours and, and every play testing comes out at one or comes out at eight? You know, so those that's the other thing um, that that I think is at the high level. Um, and Elena, we just now got a message that <laughs> Trevor is ready to join us. Well, he he's, he's, he got power back, so we'll uh, we'll give him a few minutes out to I'm sure to get his PC on and so forth. All right, cool. So, Brennan, what do you think about those categories? I think as far as you playtesting an adventure yourself, I think that, that that pretty much covers the basic. As far as you running it, you running your own adventure for different groups of people. I think that's really the, you know, you know whether or not it's fun, what the pacing is like, and the challenge level, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I also think sometimes... Um, but yeah, I think that's I think that, that, that pretty much nails what you're trying to do when you're doing it from a, a point of view. Now, I, I think it's very important in a play test to at some point to get somebody else to run your adventure for you. And mm -hmm. in that case, that's the, the fourth category is how clear are my instructions? Does everything make sense? Are there, you know, is it is it, you know, this is beyond this is before or even beyond editing, you know, is this. A, a good group of instructions that will allow someone to run my adventure for their game. Does everything make sense? 
I think it's that's one of the things that you really miss. Now, again, we're talking. I'm assuming here we're talking about playing for or writing for publication, right? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, um, you know, the the you know you want to make sure that whatever you write in there, it's it, it's clear, it makes sense, it, it you know, um, and that you don't. Sometimes you'll you'll leave bits out. They're in your head, and you kind of know how it should exactly. go, but you don't. You know, and, good point. Um, yeah, and it, it, I think that so the that, to me that's the fourth category: getting getting at somebody else, and letting them go. Hey, you know, you you keep mentioning this 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 you know whatever it happens to be the secret door. I don't even see it in there, and you're like, or or whatever it happens to be, so right. you you've just kept in your head, you know. Um, so um, that's a that's a key thing, I think. Good and, point. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I think um, you know, uh, yeah, pacing absolutely. How challenging it is, absolutely. Although it's a, it's fun. I feel like you have to do a, like a certain number of play tests to really see what the power level is because the absolutely. dice. You know what especially, I mean? always... especially with DCC. Oh my gosh! Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right, uh, Elena. Uh, he says he's writing. So if you if you could pause <laughs> us, please. <laughs> Okay, so we're back, and I brought my co-host with me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. So uh, we had just very briefly talked about, at a very high level, things that you want to accomplish with playtesting. Uh, and I had thrown out three, and then Brendan added a very good one that I hadn't really thought about. So I talked about um, uh, how long your your product will, um, if, it's, if it's an adventure, how long it will take to run, uh, what the power level is like. And is it something that people will find engaging? And then Brennan mentioned, and if someone else is GMing it, are your instructions for the GM clear? You know, so have other people play test it for you. And that I thought was a very good addition. So let's yeah. dig into some of these and see how you how you make these work, how you make them most effective in a play test environment. By the way, uh, we do not have a show coming on after us, so uh, we have some flexibility. Awesome. Awesome. So the first one was, uh, I'm sorry, what was it again, Ed? Well, in the order, in the uh, order I just now threw it out, first one was time. How long does your thing take? And again, yeah, if this is something that's just meant for, uh, you know, three, four, five game sessions, it doesn't really matter. But if it's something you're targeting for a one-off, and again, this is all, this is mostly oriented around um, adventures. You know, there is, but there is purpose to play testing other things. You know, if you have a campaign world, or even if you have a product, you know, you have some kind of special character sheet, maybe have people run some games where your character sheets are being used so that, you know, uh, if, if someone, yeah. oh, I, I can't find where the such and such is on this, you know. Yeah. yeah and that's a great example, actually. I, I did uh, these guys right here, the little DCC character folios. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I play test, play tested those personally for over two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they went through many iterations and I kept copying my character over into new ones and I would go mm -hmm. through, you know, InDesign and change everything up and make notes on what I hated and, and everything before my party even got to get them. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I don't know. I mean, Brandon, how do you handle the issue of length? Do you even well, care? Oh, I absolutely care. You know, um, I'm, I'm really a road GM, you know what I mean? To be yeah. at least I have been, I sort of evolved into it. So um, very like uh, I won't say all of my DCC adventures, but um, like most of my DCC adventures are really designed to be done in one go. You know, mm -hmm. I can run I can run Hole in the Sky in four hours, no problem. You know, um, you know most of my adventures like Neon Nights, I run Neon Nights in four hours, <laughs> like like this. You know, so um, that's um, that's important to me. Um, now that's not the end all be all of an adventure, but. Uh, I do. I, I I like to be able to say because some people say, "What's a good one you can run in, in in four hours? What's a good one you can you know?" There are great adventures out there that will take longer than that. You know, I love sailors. I, we all we all love sailors, but sailors can clearly can easily go two sessions. You know, what I'm saying I feel like you know, like you could run sailors over six or six to eight hours. You know, if the, if they spent all the time investigating the moat house and how to get across the thing, the first time I ran it, it went two sessions, like three to four hours each. You know. Um, but like, I, you know, so it's, uh, I, I try to like, you know, keep it in mind or like, or, or even, Hey, you can run this in four hours, but leave out this part. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're going to do it, you know, just for a convention, you know? Um, so, I mean, it matters, it, you know, it, to, to, you know, to, to a degree, I, you know, I, I pretty much write with that in mind these days. And it's, um, you know, 
uh, to me, like I feel like for what we typically do for the DCC, the, the slim adventures, those are 10,000 word adventures. I feel like that's a good, you know, four hours is a good, you know, you know, a good uh, a good framework to, to, to work in for a 10,000 adventure, 10,000 word adventure, you know? Um, really? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, yeah, again and again. And again. I mean, you can, you, can, you can do it longer, you know what I mean? But like, if you're, you know... So... So I find this really is an interesting question, actually, especially in terms of playtesting. Um, I never take one night to finish an adventure. I Let me give you an example. I was running 3rd edition D&D. This is 15, 20 years ago. I was running 3rd edition D&D, and they put out five really nice short adventures in 3rd in edition, not 3-5 in 3rd, uh, one of which was called The Standing Stones. I don't know if you guys remember these. They were the yeah, blue edge. Yeah, little slim, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, blue edge, slim basically almost like uh, like a Goodman game adventure, right? They were maybe maybe 10 to 12,000 words. And uh, I was in New Mexico at the time. My buddy was in uh, Tennessee and we would talk on the phone and he was he was in a gaming group as well. And he said, he told me, he's like, oh, I'm, he's like, we played through Standing Stones. He's like, and we did it in 12 hours. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. I'm like, I've been working on it for six months, right? I mean, my players, but, but here's the difference. I'm not a con judge. Yeah. I'm not somebody who takes who who makes decisions for players and my players have a larger world that they move. You know, if they get wounded, they go back to town. Right. And when they go back to town, things have changed. Mm -hmm. And so I always use a module. This and this is something that I find really interesting about the DCC community, which is so wedded to adventures. And don't get me wrong. I have five linear feet of DCC adventures on my bookshelf. Okay, so it's not like I don't buy them and I don't use them. And Standing Stones, you know, was a good example of that was, you know, there were, you know, I, I use that as a template to weave in a broader milieu of narrative and everything. I don't use it as the end all adventure. And so yeah. it's taken me four or five yeah. years to really understand this idea of short adventures. To me, they, they don't make any sense. Like, I don't know, my brain is not wired for that. Right. So I had to go to a lot of cons. And for a lot of years, when I went, I went to cons, I didn't run. I went and played mm -hmm. um, just to see what that experience was like. And it's a very different experience than what I do at home. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and everything. So so I find it really it's not that it's anathema, but it's very foreign to me to. And as a matter of fact, I experienced that at Gary Con this year. I was running an adventure. It was a play test. I told them it was a play test up front. I said, this is a. This is a, an adventure that could be short. It could take a long time or it could take a short time. It's a thinking man's adventure. This is not like a heavy combat adventure. There's a lot to think about. And um, we got we were at about the three hour and 20 minute mark. And a player did something that opened up a whole area that, that nobody knew about. And I could and one of the players at the table groaned. And he said, oh, this guy brought an adventure that wasn't for four hours. And I was like, well, wait a <laughs> you know. You know, very few in the canon of all the adventures I've ever seen published, very few of them are designed to be accomplished in four hours. Remember, I like kind of these, this new emerging two hour uh, block, because to me that takes four hours to run. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and maybe I'm just, like I said, I think I'm wired a little differently. Uh, See, I have two different approaches. If I'm, when I'm <clears throat> running at home for my, for my home game group, everything is stretched out. Um, we, we, our groups tend to be, uh, sandbox type groups that you, that you want a dynamic world and everything just, you let them run in it and, and what happens happens. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and then on the other hand, I've got, I've got convention mode and most, almost all of the adventures that I have put out that I've <laughs> published have been, you know, one of the ways to promote my products is to run adventures at cons and so i need con length adventures right and so um uh and, and a lot of times i'll write an adventure i'll think man this doesn't seem very this this product doesn't seem very long it, it's only got you know 15 20 pages or whatever and then i play test it and it's right on four hours and i feel like okay yeah it's for the purpose it's meant to serve as a one-shot adventure it's it's sized well mm -hmm. and uh you know, then I then I've, well, okay. If I'm going to use this for my, I might as well go ahead and publish it too. Then if people want to, to take it and play it, um, so yeah, I, I think that it definitely um, <clears throat> behooves you to do multiple sessions with multiple groups to get a feel for the time, 
again, because some people are going to uh, dig into every little crevice and some people are just going to yeah. anything that's there. I'm going to take yeah. out my sword. And... Well, that's the, that's the, you know, campaign play and one shot play are obviously two very different animals, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you want to be able to do both, you know, for, for whatever, what, you know, for whatever it is you're doing, I think that you, um, you know, there's a different approach to the, you know, uh, the material when you are doing it and you have, you know, when you literally say, hey, I'll meet you guys again next Friday, you know, but yeah. I mean, in the early days, so I, okay, before I came to Goodman Games, when I was with Panda Head, the, just using X-Crawl Adventures for an example, all of the original X-Crawl Adventures were um, like used three level dungeons and you couldn't, you could, you know, it would take you maybe, you know, six sessions to get through one of them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of the I Vegas crawl half for me, man. or something like that. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? You know, what I'm saying is though, like I had a player tell me like that, you know, so I would just start and we'd run and whenever we got to, we would stop, you know? And uh, I had a, Sean Noakes, in fact, a good buddy of mine now uh, was like, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's just not satisfying. I want to get to that end and have that big moment of kaboom at the mm -hmm. end. And I think that is really part of the art of the four-hour convention session, which is to you know set it up where you can have this. You know, it's short and high impact. You know, mm -hmm. so you can have this big moment at the end that's like you know, call it a set piece. You know, for whatever. You know, what I'm saying which X scroll is nothing but set pieces now. But like and that, you know, but like the that you can do that, and then you could have them walk away from the table going, okay, we had four hours. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and boom, that that we it blew up at the end. That was a lot of fun. That's a to me. That is what you want to do for a convention game: is send people off there. They've accomplished something. They've mm -hmm. had. They've had. They've got a story to tell with it, and then they walk away from it. You know, but you know, home home campaigns. Obviously, that's about character development, and you know, you know about like you know the emergent thing of it. You know, when I got to run my um, the the only really long DCC campaign I ran. You know, it was it was like it just felt like so luxurious to me to be like able to stretch it out into like, you know, sort of like, you know, we did. Um, uh, oh, what was it? The Emerald Enchanter. And uh, my guys got in and immediately killed the Emerald Enchanter in the first. He shows up just for a round and they just pulled it off. They got him. It was like, you know, like, I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> But that let me kind of explore the rest of it, really take my time. Like, right, what does it mean now that the boss of this dungeon is dead? You know what I'm saying? Where I can mm -hmm. really, you know, just, you know, like let let it sort of like unfold as it should, you know? So, hey, you know, one out. thing I think that we need to take into account with respect to time is and there are things, and this also dovetails in, in a certain sense with what Brendan was saying about things that seem intuitive to you, but not just for the, the GM, but for the players. Any number of times I've put in a puzzle of some kind that I think, uh, you know, th this will take them about this long to figure out. I don't think it's particularly uh, uh, obscure, but boy, was I wrong. And, and anybody else who, who who sits down and they're trying to solve my puzzle and I'm like, I I'm thinking, oh, it's so obvious. It's just such and such. You know, I had this one where to get through the story, you had to say this one specific word. Now, the, oh, surely this word is going to come up in general conversation. You don't even have to direct it at the door as long as you're near it and you're talking. No, no, like an hour goes on and, and the people are coming. And, and, and so you have to, that's one of the things that also you get, it's not really a balanced thing so much as just um, if you have something that's a more thought related, um, you may think it's per, it, that it'll be fairly easy to solve that thought puzzle. But... <laughs> I, and I and I think there's I think there's an intuitive difference between a thought puzzle. I have the same problem, Ed. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I love like riddles and puzzles and you know building complicated traps that require thought to try and avoid them and everything. Mm -hmm. That's just like to me a very satisfying thing. And um, and my players don't always agree with that, right? Uh, we were we were going through a thing, um, and um, it was a it was not the Lord of mysteries it was um there's another there's another god in in dcc and i i'm blanking on the name right now but um <clears throat> you know the player worshiped this god and he, and he needed to get some information from the god and so i set up a quick thing with like three sets of riddles one that i thought this this is the easy pass of riddles a medium pass riddle and then a hard riddle and if you pass all three you get the information you need to and if you fail one you have to go back and go through it again 
Mm-hmm. And um, and so I set up this little this this kind of cute little little setup and everything, and I was happy with it. And we ran through it. And I discovered that that particular player can't do riddles. He can't do them. Right? They just they're not mm-hmm. in his brainwave. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, he just does not think in riddles. And it was incredibly frustrating for him. And the and the difference there is and now he's not having fun. Yeah, he's not having fun. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I've got five other people at the table who've all solved that riddle every mm-hmm. single time, right? And they're like, oh, come on, man, this is totally easy. And this guy's pulling his hair out, super frustrated because mm-hmm. it's not a die roll based thing. You know, I think there's a good, there. this is a balance issue. The same thing is true with like, you know, what Brandon just said with the Emerald Enchanter. Emerald Enchanter shows up, someone gets a lucky shot off, kills the Emerald Enchanter in the first round, right? That that little minuscule six seconds that the guy is present, he kills him and then and then the entire world has changed. And so sometimes that can happen in a combat, you know, especially if somebody maximizes a spell result or something or maximizes a mighty deed, right? Mm -hmm. But those are acceptable things to players and to judges, especially in DCC, because they're die based and random. Mm -hmm. Whereas having to try and deal with a puzzle really is tasking the player, not the character. Mm -hmm. And and so um, so I have struggled with that myself sometimes of, you know, how do you balance this so that you're really tasking a character versus a player? And because I'll tell you how totally play test, play test, play test. Yeah. <laughs> one one approach that I've seen to solve that issue is, and and it, like Brendan mentioned, all right, fundamentally comes down to, all right, it, it has ceased to be fun at least for that person. And so you may think, well, you know, it, but by golly, it should be more. To, there should be more to it than no. The, the number one rule is 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 have fun with the game, and so um, anyway, the one one approach that I've seen to deal with that is you you include hey here's one way you can do this is by virtue of the, here's the riddle or whatever it is or a thought puzzle or whatever it is, and if the player works through this that's fine. If for whatever reason you've got a group you've got a player or a group of players that this isn't their thing. Then you have a you you include in your product a mechanism of how to achieve that through dice. Yeah. Um. And it, it, broadly speaking, for example, maybe make an intelligence check or whatever. Um. You have certain things that they can do using their character's capabilities because there is always the 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 issue that, um, you, you know, your character may actually have a more higher intelligence than you do. And we've had cases where we where someone has made the point, hey, look, my character's got a seventeen intelligence. I certainly don't. You know, can I draw upon some of that capacity? And that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But even and if I, they don't. And I, and I think there's a real analog in the game already for this. And that's thieving skills, right? Think about detecting traps and stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of what DCC relies on is players giving information to the judge and what say, I'm walking down the hallway mm-hmm. and I'm using my 10 foot pole to do this. Mm-hmm. And if you're able to detect a trap because of that, right? you can almost supersede roles, but at right. the same time, a detect trapped as a DC built into it mm-hmm. uh, intuitively. Right. I mean, you know, whether it's explicit or implicit or the judge has to make it up. And so one of the things that I have started thinking about is when you're dealing with puzzles that are more player based or could be player based, could be character based. Can you give a table of hints? Right. Yes. Based on a DC. So it's like, look, I could give you a couple of words, you know, mm-hmm. you're thinking about these words, while mm-hmm. you're thinking about that riddle, right? Mm-hmm. You could give them some prompts mm-hmm. um, and stuff. You know, that's an, you know, so so yeah. We've gotten way off the topic of time, though. Um, I, <laughs> I find it. I do find DCC time uh, to be, you know, especially like on the Facebook forums and everything, highly regulated by cons, right? And I think it's because people like Brandon have proselytized DCC out to the masses at conventions. Mm-hmm. Primary, you know, this is we we see this quite often. DCC is a great con game. It isn't a long campaign game, and I'm here mm-hmm. to tell you that I've been running I've been running campaign I've been running a DCC campaign now for four years, mm-hmm. and uh, and I've been running a Langbar yeah. campaign since it came out with the same characters, mm-hmm. and it works phenomenally well. Right? Yes. Well, I, you know, I think it's even worth uh, keeping in mind though that even if you're doing for your 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 home game group, um. I think one of the reasons why, well, 
I think that, that a four hour game is also a fairly decent, maybe a little bit on the short side, but a fairly decent time slot for a home game group. Um, and I think that uh, having, having at least that, that's not to say that everything you put out has to be doable in one session, but at least if they have a sense of, oh, this is probably going to take X number of sessions. Um, I think that's, that's useful to have that kind of feel. Yeah. And, you know, Brandon mentioned set pieces. I use adventures as set pieces. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to go do this now. Mm -hmm. okay. Somebody in Lankmar has tricked you into doing this, right? Yeah. Or a gang lord is pressuring you to do that. Right. Yeah, and I do the same thing. Um, you can drop a, a, a published adventure into a campaign as a, here's the thing you're doing at this particular point quite easily. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, you know, I get, I totally get the idea of play test, play test, play test for time length. Um, I just intuitively, I don't think that way. And I find it very mm -hmm. difficult to think about. Um, to me, what I look at when like we ran, I'm, we've got a project called house, the petrified frog, and I gave it to two other judges to run. They ran it at Gen Con a couple mm -hmm. years ago. I ran it at Gen Con. So we all three ran it within a four day period. And then we came back and everybody accomplished what we were asking them to accomplish. And they all did it in very different ways. Mm -hmm. And so that tells me that there's a lot of flexibility to solving the problems mm -hmm. and everybody had a, had fun, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so, and, you know, and there was some challenge, um, you know, which some groups find more frustrating than others. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, um, I think it's very easy to accept non forward momentum when the bad guys just get good, lucky rolls and defeat you but it's hard when it's not obvious why you can't make forward momentum. Right. And, and so trying to deal with that and figure out where are those moments in a, in an adventure are important. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, I think, I think we pretty well covered the, the issue of time. So let's, let's talk about balance. Uh, again, let's assume, assuming that the product that we're talking about here is an adventure. Um, how do you, uh, what are your mechanisms that, by which when you're doing your play testing, you look at, the impact of balance and especially you know we've already talked about this to some extent but with dcc there has to be the understanding that the error bars on this are really large because um you know, i remember a game i played uh, that brendan ran at uh at origins i was in and this was like an eighth level module and we we're up against this this i think we were taking on our patron and i threw mind wipe at him and Brennan wrote a one on the save. And oh, it just, yeah. I mean, the yeah. whole game oh, just became gosh, a totally different picture. <laughs> and but oh. my, soon I still talk about that to this day. Um, but I, that was but, a good game. It, yeah, it was memorable. And it, um, but anyway, high and low die rolls in DCC can swing things so radically, and which just speaks to the GM has to be able to roll with what mm -hmm. happens. But with that in mind, Working that into your play test. Well, I think, you know, part of it is, you know, making sure that you're doing it multiple times. You know, you know, if, if a group goes into room A and they get beat up, there's a lot of reasons that could happen. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know, but if it happens that every time you run it, then you should probably take a look at like, you know, you know, what, what you're doing over the average amount of time. Um, I, I think, you, I think you have to take notes as you play test too, and sort of be like, all right, well, this is, you know, cause sometimes like, this is the thing. Sometimes you'll see, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, someone will make a decision that seems really fun or is really exciting and winds up really snapping back in their face. I'll try something really radical and it doesn't work out. They'll, you know, they'll, you know, or they, they, you know, for whatever reason, they'll get an idea about something, you know. So you got to look at yourself like, all right, is this my fault? Is, is something not clear here or, or whatever? Or is it just the, the vagaries of play styles? And someone is like, oh, I thought it would be a good idea to, you know, everyone should jump into the lava. It's, just, it's probably an illusion or whatever, you know. Whatever Why else would it be there? Yeah, it's, it's you know, yeah, um, exactly, you know. Um, so I think, you know, you know, you got to... When something like that happens in your own play test, then you have to make a note of that and go, okay, they all went and did this. And some, like I said, that's just going to happen sometimes, you know, and, and it could be a lot of things, you know what I mean? You know, food just showed up, you know what I mean? Or, or, or whatever, you know, there's, there's so many, you know, different reasons that something can go very south very quickly. 
But um, I feel like you just have to, you know, just do it, do it, do it a few times. And when those instances take place in the game, make a note of it. So like, well, everyone died in this adventure, but they got it in their heads to not use their ranged weapons, and they all charged my three-headed snapping piranha or whatever. You know what I mean? You know, for for whatever reason. You know what I'm saying? And and then go, okay, this this is the time. So realize that characters will build in their own anomalies into their own sessions that you have to account for when you're you know you know doing it. If you're doing something for publication, I mean, playtesting is king. You want to do it absolutely as many times as you can. You want to get absolutely as many outside GMs to run it for you and send you decent notes. You know, and like the ultimate, if you ever get the chance for this, and I've only been able to do it like three times in my whole life sit in on a play test where the GM is running your adventure and the other players don't know that you wrote it. That's, mm. you know what I mean? And then just kind of sit back and kind of feel it out. There's no better way to do it, but it's, it's really tricky to pull off. And you always feel like, you know, it's, it's I, I'm, I'm not much for tricking people. Like, it seems like, it feels like a trick. Like, ta-da, it was me the whole time I wrote it. Yeah, you know, you feel like, mm. yeah. but if you can, if you can do it though, like that's, I got to play through an, an, an extra adventure like that one time. Um, and boy, it was heck fun. You know what I mean? When the puzzles came up, I just kept quiet. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't know. You, y'all figure it out, you know? So I don't know. But I feel like, um, you know, I, I feel like the only way to sort of defeat that randomness thing is getting as many instances in at your playtest as you can and really paying attention when when they do something that's very strange or very unusual and you know and and the opposite happens sometimes too you know the first time i ever ran neon knights which has uh, now been published in I don't know, like 2017 i want to say um and the first time they got to the room where the the wizard summons them in there and they immediately were like that's what's going on this and they just blew everything and took them out you know what I mean? And it was like, whoa! Like they, you know, someone did like a twenty point spell burn. I mean, I'm talking <laughs> about, I'm talking about twenty five minutes into the game, mm-hmm. realized this, this is the problem, and then just wiped him out. And I'm like, well, and it, it was, you know, that's when you got to a roll with it in the game and be like, okay, well, what does what does this adventure look like now? They decapitated it. You know, what does the rest of this adventure look like? But also, um, like, is this something I need to change? Yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't. I, I ran it a bunch more times and realized, okay, that was an exceptional one. So I made it, I gave, you know, I, I gave, made it a little harder to do that. Not too much harder because it's a, uh, it's legit. I think sometimes that's fair. If, if, you know, like, especially in a game like DCC, if, if they have been smart, if they've conserved their resources, sometimes they blow stuff up. I ran uh, a DCC version of the um, Palace of the Silver Princess at, Je- at uh, Gary Con one year. And um, it was very, very different. It was totally DCC'd out, you know what I'm saying? And I have, I was almost getting frustrated. I had a wizard at the table who wouldn't cast spells. He was just he was shooting arrows. And I'm like, are you having fun? Because and he just miss, miss, miss. And he gets to that last room and like, here's the thing. And here's everybody. He's like, okay. And, you know, 20 points, spell burn and uh, flaming hands and put pay in the room. I was like... You know what I mean? Like you, you, you know, I would never not want to reward that guy for playing a really careful game and thinking of it like he's his wizard. He's like, oh, I'm gonna save it, you know, like you know, if you think about how spell casting in DCC is, his guy actually played a very a very realistic role-playing version of what that would be like. Like every time I cast a spell, I could wind up with a lobster claw or <laughs> you know what I mean, some other ridiculous thing. I'm saving that for when you know right. what I mean? When right. I really, you know. So and you, so you you have to allow for it on both sides is what I'm saying is for yeah. those amazing moments where they just blow your action up and you're just like well that's it and those times when they're like no we'll just we'll, we'll <laughs> I'll jump down the monster's throat and I'll kill it from the inside and you're like okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I think one thing that that brings up uh, that makes that I think about is. Play test with people who are experienced with DCC and also with people who have never played it before or at least have very little experience with it. Mm. Um, because uh, things, for example, uh, this player that you mentioned, the first thing that I thought of until you mentioned that he did this spellburn, first thing that I thought of was, oh, he's because he's come from D&D, so he's used to, I cast a spell and it's gone. And so he's saving yeah. spells because of that. Now, given the way that he ended, maybe that's not the case. 
But no, no, he, you do have to. This guy knew what he was. Doing. <laughs> you do have to um, uh, keep in mind when you're when you're running it that DCC has in in certain fundamental ways is very different from from other games. And you know, for, when I run at cons, consistently eighty percent or more of my players at the table have never played DCC before. Wow. And and I don't know if that's unusual, but. I, I, Con after con after con, that that pattern has held for me. In fact, yeah. I occasionally have people who have never RPG'd before. Yeah, and and they are going to take a very different approach than someone who uh, is very big into DCC and is always thinking in terms of, uh, especially Mighty Deeds, for example. Yeah. Oh, I gotta, I I have to be creative with this because. Um, otherwise my warrior isn't doing much and, and it's not built into the system. And so I, I think it's important when you're doing play testing, uh, play test it with players of different level of experience with DCC. Yes. Absolutely. No, I think it's a great idea. And, um, you know, ideally you'd have one of it, you know what I mean? You know, in an ideal world, you know, imagine if we were actually doing this professionally and we could hire our play testers and we could say, all right, all I'm doing for the next two months is play testing this thing every day. And they'd be like, you know, super experienced, no experience, middle ground, you know, mm-hmm. all men, all women, you know, people, from, you know what I'm saying? Like every, every different possible permutation of a table composition would be, you know what I mean? Obviously mm-hmm. optimal, but like, you know, you know, but <laughs> life and time is what it is, you know? Yep. So, um, but the, you know, it, it's, it's funny. It was, the in the old days it was easier for me i would just run you know i I would i would take an adventure to the convention and i would run it so you know just like you know i I ran hole in the sky 50 times before it got published i ran neon knights 50 times before it got published at least you know um now i can't i can't do that as much my convention i don't i don't do as many conventions my pace is faster for everything so I rely more on outside people to, you know, you know, you, you make you make the deals you can with people, and you're like, hey, play test, play test, play test. So, you know, but um, you know, and what a what a what a what a great problem to have to have. Oh, I'm gonna have to run my fun game for you know <laughs> all these times this month, Wah! you know, right? So, yep. Yeah. You know. So, so you run. I mean, you, you, I mean, and and it's been clear for a long time if you've watched uh, or listened to old episodes of Spellburn. Or seen, you know, seen you a talk on anything about playtesting that that a lot of the adventures that you've you've written get playtested extensively. And, yeah, and I have to think that is probably not true for most adventures, right? I mean, I you know, and not and I'm I'm not talking about DCC adventures. I'm talking about most adventures in general. You know, and you how know, many, I don't know how many times uh, do you playtest a given adventure on average? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Now you um, do a lot of conventions, and I have to tell you guys, Ed has, like Brandon, an unearthly agil- uh, ability to make his fortitude check at a con, because his average number of events are like what eight to twelve. Yeah, right I'm now. running nine. Yeah, I'm running nine at Origins this year. Yeah, I, I'm lucky if I get through three, right? <laughs> and that's me playing or running. I mean, you know, I'm, wow. I'm just not that high paced. <laughs> so here's the thing, uh, and I know this is going to go against a lot of conventional wisdom that we're talking about here. Um, I do not do nearly as much play testing with my publications before they go to print (coughs) as I probably ought to. And and there's two reasons for that. One is um, a lot of times I have difficulty finding play testers. Um, There are occasions where I put out on, on, on Facebook or whatever other mechanism say, Hey, I need some, some play testers for whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't often get responses. Um, the other, and and some of that is a matter of um, visibility. I mean, it's it's it. You know, to be quite honest, I'm sure it's much easier to accomplish when when you when you're a, a name that people are more familiar with. Um, the other thing is. <clears throat> um, one thing that I tend to do in terms of, of play testing. Now, oftentimes I'll play test it with my, my home game group. <clears throat> and then also what I t- all tend to do is uh, I'll sit down with, with uh, Sun and I, and we'll go through kind of a tactical play test in the sense of, especially from a balance standpoint, 
in the yeah. sense of, all right, well, you take this many characters, I'll take this many characters, and we'll go through, and we'll just kind of see how we think things are going to commonly work out. Um, from and, and so I feel like from a balance standpoint, we 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 work that out pretty well. Um, and she thinks very differently enough from me that if I've got a puzzle situation in there that I think is reasonable, and if she says, "Look, nobody's going to get this," okay, then I, I then then I I can take value from that. From a time standpoint, um, I don't. I just feel like I've I've gotten really good at gauging how long something's going to take. And like I said, I I you know I have certain metrics that you know most uh, in, in most combats are about a half hour when you're playing at a con i have certain certain metrics that i take that i guess this is going to take about this long and for whatever reason when it comes down to to uh, real execution uh my guesses are are pretty on target and so uh, i don't do nearly as much play testing now i do a lot of running them and after i've run it at a con you know x number of times i might tweak it a little bit um, but oftentimes it's already been published at that point. And, you know, I make, might make a new version of it and, and you know, release an update. <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that I find really interesting um, in terms of playtesting adventures and stuff, um, did either of you play um, third edition uh, back in the old Living Greyhawk days during the height? It's like the height of the RPGA. Um, mm -hmm. I, I so, played in those days, but I never played uh, the in, you know the living Greyhawk. Part. So I, you know, if you think of the Living Greyhawk system and the output they had at the point in time, at that point in time, it was phenomenal, right? The United States and, as a matter of fact, the entire world was broken into regions, and so like the state of Ohio was the you know was the uh, Duchy of um, Valuna, right? And we were one country, and that country had uh, you know had people who were orchestrating the Living Campaign. And they were required to put out X number of adventures per year, right? And so often that was like 12 to 16 adventures, not that they wrote, but that they had a cohort of people who with them wrote those. And that was just the Valuna adventures. And then you had the RPGA doing regional adventures or, or multiple regional adventures, right? So sometimes two or three regions would get together and have kind of a big event. And then you would have the, the big RPGA events as well. And so there were amazingly, I think mean, it was like probably in the output of the RPGA at that point, four, for, I think it was four or five years for, for living Greyhawk, they probably put out 400 adventures, right? And in, during that time, you know, they're on a strict four hour schedule. And so they had beats. It was like, you know, you had a, this beat, that beat, that beat, that beat done. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I played in a lot of those um at cons and stuff um i didn't enjoy them as much as i enjoy dcc modules i think that's the system not necessarily the players or the judges or anything but what i found was that they were very very consistent in terms of time mm -hmm. it was amazing how consistent they were right i mean i never saw like groups go long they were done in three and a half to three hours and 45 minutes um yeah so i mean all, most of those adventures are available for free online um and you can go find them their whole archives of this stuff and play through them they're, they're a great resource and uh it's you know i mean brandon talks about a, a ten thousand word um you know dcc module being a good four hour play for my type of uh speed uh, three and a half to four thousand words is actually where i find mm -hmm. a good balance at four hours and maybe it's just a difference <clears throat> in running style well and i think writing style makes a big difference in terms of well what are those words you know, yeah. and and a lot of my adventures, I have a lot of exposition that gives. Here's the background to why, and and in terms oh, of yeah. so in terms of how long it takes to play it, that doesn't count. <laughs> That's just a matter of helping to set an atmosphere. Right, and and one of the things that when when we started writing, we started putting out because we put out a couple of adventures now. Hangman's Garden for you know Dieter had run for years, and then also um, for whom the bell trolls, and when we did for whom the bell trolls we kind of put beats in there, right? It was like, okay, so what I need is a bullet list of if this happens, go to this, this next, this next, it was an open, open scenario. It wasn't like a tunnel or anything or a, <laughs> or a dungeon. They could go here or they could go there. Or they could go there. And it was, it was, it was just a general framework guideline at the end of each area. Hey, if this happens, you're going to go to this area next. And if this mm -hmm. happens, you're going to go to that area, but this is going to be different. And it was very, very specific. 
and and that helped. Uh, you know, I've run that a couple of times, and it's fit well within a four hour time frame. But yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think actually most adventures get run, get play tested like DCC adventures. I mean, I find that to be amazing hmm. uh, that they get run so often before they go to publication. And I and I actually I actually think that's something that's maybe um, part of the unsung success of the of the DCC product line. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Brandon had that opportunity to to, you know, Joseph Goodman was sending him to con after con after con after con after con. It was like, I mean, I think you were doing it something like twelve to thirteen, fourteen cons a year at one point. Yeah, oh, no. yeah. I it did the same. Uh, I did nineteen in twenty eighteen. <laughs> oh my word! So yeah, so. <laughs> So that's a lot of cons, right? And that's the other problem is, is is the best place to try this out for some of us, especially third-party publishers, to get the audiences past our home group is to go to a convention. Mm-hmm. And conventions are expensive. They're time intensive. Um, they're usually over weekends, but that doesn't matter because you got a day of travel, you got a day of travel back, and you have all these things going on. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I average, my costs average right about a thousand dollars to go to a con. So when I'm, you know, planning my con schedule, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of money. Right. And so if I get to four cons a year, that's actually a huge investment of time and money. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want to make it as profitable as possible in yeah. terms of output oh, and, yeah. and input. Right. Because mm-hmm. I, part of why um, I go to the con is I always leave conventions like I, in two States, either completely exhausted or mm-hmm. really invigorated. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I have so many good ideas because I sat and talked to so many cool people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, I'll tell you what, though. Th- this is really for the audience and, and things. If you are looking to publish third party and you're trying to get more of that in, look to the online cons. You know, yeah. um, you can do that at almost no, because if you're GMing, they're typically free. Mm-hmm. And they are, they're, 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 they're going on all the time. You know, obviously, you got to find a place where you can run you know, some, some conventions, some online conventions are specific to one scenario or, or one game or whatever and such. But I mean, you, you know, I, I would recommend that, like just as, you know, as many as you can. And then, you know, just, like, join all of these online groups. If you have a DCC game, I bet you if you were to go on to, you know, DCC RPG Rocks any given Saturday afternoon and be like, hey, can I, you know, I'm looking for six people that want to play a game tonight. You know what I mean? You'll, yeah. you know, you'll get some random people who will, you know, can, can sit and do it for four hours and who will probably have enough experience in the game that you won't have to spend an undue amount of time explaining the rule set to everybody, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I mean, I've, I've done that with a couple. <laughs> I've had a couple of emergencies, like, we're like where I had to make a major change at the last minute. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, we decided to put this piece of art in, so you have to cut out X many words. And you're like, uh, that wasn't for Goodman Games, it was for somebody else. But I did have to do it. <laughs> and it was like, uh. so like I quick, you know, had a rig run, like, you know, jump in and run two more play tests to, to to knock everybody in there and such. But but I'm just saying it's um, you know, um, you know, now is that the same as running it at a live show? Uh, it's debatable, you know. Um, in some ways, it's uh, like this is what I found about online online games in general. It's better in some ways. It is absolutely better in some ways. In some ways, it's not, and yeah. it's, you have to deal with both sides of that yeah. and realize that that's going to feel very different in either way. But it will allow you to test your puzzles out really well. It'll te- like um, your the, the the challenge level, the time things. What becomes a factor is that it's very. Mm-hmm. I think it's vastly different running a game when everyone's at home and their kids are coming in and it's like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what? I'm going to throw something in the, in the microwave. You know what I mean? Right, or whatever. Right, you know what I mean? Right. If people are taking these long breaks, you're like, ah, you know, but, yeah. um, um, but it's still, it, I don't, but that doesn't discount it as a resource. I don't think. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Well, you know, and of I course, think- another option, op, uh, opportunity, although mind you, I've tried this numerous times, numerous times and, and not, and rarely have had it work out well, but is your friendly local game store. Um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, every time I've posted up, or at least in the past uh, few years, I, when I arrange for an event at a game store, I show up and I have no players. But um, regardless, you know, uh, th- that works well for a lot of people. And, you know, especially if you connect with the game store, you've got one that you've been going to, you're, you're, you're a regular person there. Um, <clears throat> running that, uh, your game store can be a good opportunity to have some of the benefits of a con in terms of this is new people without the expense of a con. Yeah, absolutely. 
right? Which is why I rue the day <laughs> that Todd Bunn closed Gateway Games. Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand, but I'm still not really happy about it. No, I know what you mean. You know what? what the, I feel like uh, a really good game store creates an atmosphere, of the, a little, it's, a, it's like an ongoing mini convention that you're all right. people show up at. And when they close, it's like, yeah! Right. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in, still in New York, there was Legacy of Adventure, which was this game that my game shop out there. And, um, you know, like it was, there was, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't playing professionally or, or running anything professionally at the time, but you know, you could always go and get a game. You could always go and do it. And when that place closed down, it was like, you know what I mean? Like part of my soul I flew out the window. <laughs> you know? right. so. it, well, and, and, and actually, I mean, uh, to kind of blend the two, the online convention and the in-person, you know, you know, local friendly local gaming store event, you know, um, early in the days of, well, you know, mid Spellburn, uh, but early in the days of Appendix N, uh, you know, uh, book club, uh, Jeff Goad used to talk quite a bit about how he set up an online meet place to help people schedule and stuff yeah. in New York City. Yeah. And he, so, um, yeah. I forget what it was called. It was like something like the, it was a dedicated gamer site, though, that you could mm -hmm. go and, and say, hey, I want to run this. Does anybody interested? And then people yep. would, would like hook up and at the, at the, at the at, you know, at the friendly yep. local gaming store and run things. And so, you know, you can combine those things to try and find it. Now, absolutely it works best if you're in a big metropolitan area. I mean, Cincinnati, yeah. which is where Ed and I are at, we've got a lot of potential gamers, but getting them together is hard because it's over, you know, I mean, there's, you know, sometimes it could take an hour and a half to get to your next game store. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, and it, you know, if you're playing live, definitely, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but so there's, there's, there's options there for playtesting. I think, I think we've pointed out some excellent ones. Yeah, uh, you know the online and one more for you guys join the road crew and uh add stuff on run online games and add them to the uh our the goodman games event calendar you will find players and you'll get people from like sri lanka and, yeah uh, right you know, right Rio de Janeiro. it'll be amazing that yeah. is some cool stuff right there let me right? tell you Isn't about that, that. The coolest? Yeah. yeah and so so that's and so let me explain what brandon's talking about for those of you who may not be road crew people and Brandon, I'm not a road crew person. I try. I think I signed up for one finally. I run all this stuff, but then I forget to actually put it up there. But what happens is, is you go onto the Goodman Games website. They've just retooled it, is my understanding. I think Matt Robertson put out a an email to you know to that effect that you can now go and uh, and put your event up online, and it's like advertisement, right? It basically it's a calendar, and all the mm -hmm. upcoming events are on there. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that Ed just posted all of his Gen Con events. I know because I was there on the same days you know, trying to get my events in and stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and everything. So yeah, not only is it a great advertising source, but in the end you get road crew points, right? So, you know, the number of events that you run gets you some road crew swag, which is always a great way to reciprocate and thank play testers. Yeah. Um, other than taking yes. their names and making sure that you give them some credit in the book, which, mm -hmm. which is 100% do that. Yeah. But, and, and it's a great way to, to like, you know, for bragging rights, right? I mean, you know, there aren't many people who can say, hey, I play tested this. You know, it comes up rarely that I play tested the original uh, werewolf book for, uh, you know, game for White Wolf Games. back. Oh, that's in amazing. First edition. Yeah. And it was the first the first printing, by the way, by the, that manuscript uh, recently sold at auction for over a thousand dollars. That, that cool? one White Wolf sent me for free and said, here, play test this. And I, oh, I hand typed, nice. you know, 35 pages back saying this is crazy. Right. You know, yeah. You know, with with that in mind, um, I'll mention something that now that I'm that I've been doing publishing for a while, it doesn't feel as significant for me. But as I look back on it, I can think, yeah, but but before those days, this was an attractive thing for me is when you're when you're uh, soliciting for play <laughs> testers mention, you're going to get us a, a mention in the front of my book. And, you know, for for, for some people. And, you know, I can certainly remember uh, having this kind of sentiment myself when I buy this product and I get to show my my gaming buddies, hey, look, you know, my name's in this uh, as one of the play, uh, play testers. You know, um, it's a nice thank you. And it's also something that appeals to people who, you know, um, as you're as you're casting that net out. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. good bragging rights. Yeah. yeah. So um, the one uh facet of this that we haven't really dug into and, and uh, that i think we want to turn to is the the idea that brendan brought up which is um working in uh or or looking for things that come from your play testing that help you realize oh 
I did not write this clearly for the GM. Um, and I think that uh, any, especially anytime you start getting creative and you've got your own monster, you've got a trap in there, you've got a, you know, some kind of puzzle or there's something that's, and I think um, certainly I, I oftentimes have um, some sections of the game that are role play intensive. Uh, and when I'm doing that, I need to really characterize this is what this person is like. If you're going to be, if I want the GM to be talking as this person and engaging in conversation as this person, give them something. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to just give statements that I've got to read off a list. Like it's a computer game. I want the GM to have some background and some sense of where they can really ad lib from that, of, of that character. So what are, what are various other things that we want to have in mind as we're having uh, play testing to look for, did I write it in a well that in a way that is good for the GM as well as the player? Yeah, that's huge. And it's, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't give good instructions to your GMs and your GMs are not going to run it. I mean, they, they'll, here's the thing. GMs will amaze it. will still run great games, but it won't be your game. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They have to fill in a lot of enough gaps, you know? So give them all of the tools, even if they don't, you know, it's GM's fiat. Once they, once that adventure exists out in the world and they get it out there and they're like, oh, this is great, but you know what would be even more fun if all these hobgoblins were ninjas or whatever it happened. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right. Or, or my, my buddy is like, hey, I, I'm going to run this, but I'm going to run this. He, like he, he took a, he, he was notorious for taking fantasy adventures and then running them with a top secret and making spy things. He just did it. He was, you know, and he couldn't mm-hmm. be stopped. You know, but um, make it absolutely as clear as you can and, and pay real attention. If someone gets back to you, I've got one right now. I got a place for comment today. And hey, if, if you're one of my play catchers, I got 10 today and I owe you all comments and it won't be until next week because it's like I was gone. But someone was like, you know, you never see this one door is locked. Why can't they just open it? And I was like, Whoa. you know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's something to get in there and fix, you know. Um, So pay a lot of attention to that. And, um, you know. The, the um, you know, I, I groups that write good reports and really tell you what when they don't understand rather than just fixing it on the fly are precious. And um, mm-hmm. hey, yeah, you know, let me just say huge thanks to everybody out there who play tests and especially the GMs who put all that effort into it. You know, I, I'm so grateful to the, um, you know, the, uh, the community, everybody I can reach out to who uh, runs my stuff and who, you know, runs, you know, and and, and does a good job with it, like, and, and sends me good notes, like, oh. You know, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so that that I think let's not let's not miss that point of they take the time because you know this takes uh, something out of their time to reach out to you and get in touch with you. And this is one of the reasons why in all my publications I have my email address. You know, and I've had a couple of cases where someone has has reached out to me and said, "Hey, you know, I'm kind of unclear about this or that." And so, you know, based on what they say, sometimes I'll I'll issue out an update, but um yeah i i i want to i want to thank those people who take that time to reach out and, com- and communicate that information because it helps me make the product better yeah so i i totally agree with both what brennan and what ed have said i got a couple i got two takes to 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 elaborate on that um the one thing i learned teaching in academia and i when i left academia i had over four million student hours of teaching time in is um is the best way to learn something is to say it out loud and tell somebody about what it is that you were supposed to learn. If you need to understand how an electric circuit works, actually showing someone the electric circuit and explaining what's happening at each step is a great way to show that you understand it. And the same thing is true in a play test. And one of the things that I like to do with a trusted friend is send them the manuscript and then get on a meeting or meet them for lunch and have them walk me through what I just sent them. And oh, interesting. Them tell me, what does this mean? Right. right. And it, it works on anything. It doesn't have to be an adventure, although it's wonderful for adventures because you could say, well, in area one, you know, you're going to encounter X and there's these other things too. Right. And so if, if, and I'm following along looking at the manuscript and if I can see that they don't see things, they will tell me if it's not clear, right? Um, simply by either directly saying, hey, I don't understand what's going on here or by missing things or by coming up with an entirely different interpretation of what just happened 
or what is supposed to happen in your mind in that space. So, you know, clarity um, can be, you, you can, you can understand another person's clarity of, of what you're, of what they're reading of your work by having them tell you back what that was supposed to be. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, and, that's really good. It's really awesome. Now on uh, the, the, the ancillary to that is, um, is you should always edit your work for three things, clarity, brevity, and active voice. And the reason for those three things to edit for clarity should be obvious, right? I want people to understand what I'm saying. If the sentence is gobbledygook, nobody knows what happens. And as a matter of fact, over time, you will forget what that was supposed to mean. And I, and I can't stress this enough. I have had this happen as a result of multiple save files in Microsoft Word. Sometimes a file corrupts and literally a sentence changes. And I, and I, and I've seen it happen. So just be very careful and, and, you know, uh, edit for clarity. Um, sometimes that means reducing words. One of the things that I used to do while I was teaching and I would be uh, working on PowerPoint slides, right. Is at the end of the semester, I would go through the slides and I would reduce the word count by 25%. It had to say the same thing, but it was 25% less. And within a year or two, you discover that you can't take any more words away but you're left with the absolute minimum number of words to A, prompt yourself and B, prompt the reader, right? The person who's looking at that slide for the first time as to what's going on. So everybody can understand it clearly with his, and that's where conciseness comes in, right? Being overly verbose, you know, and, and verbose and having tons of extra flowery language can be wonderful to read. Um, you know, everybody, Everybody, of course, enjoys, you know, a good Wuthering Heights or Pride and Prejudice, right? But, uh, but the truth is, is, is when you're, when you're trying to use something and, and, and what we are creating is, is works of use, right? Um, conciseness can be really helpful. One of the things, you know, there's new modern ways of framing gaming systems, you know, or adventures. And one of the things that I've really tried to do, Nick Barron talks about this quite a bit, is trying to put, um, uh, trying to put everything you need to run a given area on a two-page spread. Now that works really well because you know my two-page spreads are really uh, pretty close to one eight and a half by eleven page, right? And so um, and so <laughs> when you've got a bigger product that may be not as useful, and sometimes you have one or two things on there. Um, but make sure everything's there. If it needs a map, you know I find especially it's really helpful to put a little sub portion of the map right there, especially because as the as the producer of the product, you can annotate it in a way that the judge sees that nobody else does. And you can say, hey, there's a trap here. Hey, DC for this is that. So using conciseness and some graphic design skills, you can highlight things in a way that call them out. Um, and then the last is, uh, what did I say? It was, it was uh, active, oh, active voice. Active voice is so important. I can't tell you. You can write in a passive voice and I naturally do. And then I go and I take out all of the ofs and thens and all of those statements and make it so it's clear that Bob is using the ax instead of Bob's a woodsmith and he happens to live in Wisconsin and sometimes he has an ax that he uses, right? So changing that sentence so that it's clear what's actually going on, what your point of it is, matters. And I, and, and, and when you write for, for, for you know, active voice, you're usually aligning noun, verb, adverb, or adjective, right? So that everything is clear. And, and those things, I don't think you can understate those. Editing is half of my budget at this point. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, those, those are just my thoughts on top of Brandon's and Ed's. All of that stuff, also gold. But, uh, but those are the things that I would add to that. Absolutely. All right, so now I've sucked all of the energy out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, I think we've we've touched on uh, the major points pretty well. Uh, if we if we wrap things up at this point, uh, let me go first to Brendan. Is there anything uh, that you would put forth as a uh, a summary of? Hey, uh, if if I could leave you with one thing to remember about play testing here here's the couple of things that are the 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 big takeaways um you know the more you play test the 
the better chance that you are, the better chance you'll have to put out a really fun, really good adventure, you know? Um, so um, I do absolutely as much of it as you can. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, it, it, it's, it's consider it another stage of the writing, you know, like you've written it. If, if we're doing what we do, you know, consider it like something that you wouldn't let it go out of the house without, like you wouldn't send a manuscript to print if it hadn't been edited. You know what I'm saying? You wouldn't, you know, same thing. I think it's that important. And um, I never really thought about what Trevor said before, but about like, you know, the, the amount of playtesting we do being, um, you know, being a factor in what we have here. Maybe, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not going to think about it. But it's like, um, but it, it's certainly, I certainly couldn't rule it out because we do play test a lot and, you know, it's, uh, you know, and, and you know, thoroughly. So, um, you know, get out there and do that for your own adventures and, uh, you know, do, do, do good work. Trevor. Yeah. So I think, I think as a third party publisher, you know, which is what we hope to come back to every, every time we, we do a scrivenery episode is um, I, I think you should think of it a couple of ways. Um, first of all, play testing a product in advance of releasing it um, is a wonderful form of advertising. Um, you know, let your players know that they're, it's a play test so that if it happens to go a little South, um, you can sit back and say, okay, guys, why did that just happen? And get get their vested, you know, response. Um, when it comes to player response, and I'm not sure if, if Brandon and Ed touched on this beforehand, before I got on, sorry, power outage. Um, you know, I always ask, uh, and this is actually something I think I got again from Nick, um, or maybe it was somebody else. I always ask players for two, two questions. That's all I care about from a player. Um, you know, what what things did you find were fun in the in the, in the play test and what things did you find were not fun right and i always keep notes what what was it that they found that was fun what was it that they found that was not fun um and then be mindful of the fact that sometimes like i said like with puzzles and everything some people just don't enjoy puzzles right but if nobody likes your combats that's probably a hint that there's a problem um and everything so i would i would i would i would leave with that um, when it comes to judges and getting judge feedback, try and get as comprehensive a feedback as you can. What did they find was difficult and, um, and what did they find was an ease? And again, it, it, you know, I also find that it's sometimes helpful to even do a, a preliminary layout when I hand a manuscript over to a judge. It's not the final thing they're going to see, but sometimes I ask them, what else would be on this page if, the, if this was the perfect layout for you? You know, mm -hmm. what else would you like to find mm -hmm. on here? Yes, and, if organized well. Yeah, yeah, and and and, mm -hmm. and try and get feedback on organization, and organization is not just at the writing level; it's also at the design level. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, I totally cool. agree. So, uh, yeah, so my my uh, fifty thousand foot things would be um, play test with different players, ideally with players who have different level of experience, different play styles, etc. And, you know, I, something that, that struck me is, as Trevor was saying, focus on the point with the group. Hey, this is a play test. Tell yourself that, too. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but me, if um, when I first, almost without fail, when I receive uh, constructive criticism, my initial reaction is to get defensive about it. And then I calm myself down and, and, and look at, okay, this is, this is valid. This is useful information. I should be grateful for this. In a play test, especially if you said to the players, hey, this is a play test, you know, offer, offer feedback as we're going along. If, if it's serving the purpose, they're going to do exactly that. And tell yourself ahead of time, at least if you have um, some difficulty with it like me, tell yourself ahead of time, this is what I'm looking for. And it's not just, it's okay, but it's, it's, it's good thing that I'm getting this. And so, um, that you are, you know, as they're giving you these tips, these, these bits of information, even if you disagree with it, take a note of it, write it down, think on it for a while. You may find after a while, you know, they're kind of right. Or I've run this for five play tests. And everybody is saying, or four out of the five times, they're saying this thing. I may disagree with it, but that it, if people don't like my product, 
because of this issue or they don't like it as much because of this issue, then maybe I need to to reconsider my, my thought on it. So folks, uh, I think that brings us to end of this episode. Uh, we've got uh, coming up in two weeks, we're going to be meeting with, uh, I forget the name of Trevor. Tom Denks, Densk, um, the person who, the, the group that put together um, um, the Tournament of Pigs. Right, I, yeah, okay. Sorry, you caught me off guard there. But yes, we'll be talking with the team that put out Tournament of Pigs, and that will be the final episode for your season, for the spring season, and then we'll be back in the fall. Absolutely. So I want to thank again uh, our guest, Brendan, for, for joining us for this conversation. It's always great to have him as, as part of our little gathering here. Yeah, thanks and, for having me on. And uh, we don't say this enough. Uh, thanks to Elena for for Oof. handling all the background stuff. Hey, Elena! That's it, right. that's, it's, it's, it can be a thankless job. And mm -hmm. so I just want to say, hey, uh, uh, thank you for what you do because you make this so so smooth to do. And uh, we're, we mm -hmm. just really appreciate the, the effort that you put in. Mm -hmm. And happy graduation. Have fun. Hey, did she graduate? Ooh. Awesome. Congratulations. Uh, this weekend. She's, she's going to the graduate this weekend. Wait, wait. Out. You're here with us instead of out partying? Elena. <laughs> what have you not learned from college? Okay. So All with right. that in mind, uh, we'll see you again in two weeks, folks. And that'll be it for the spring season. Catch right. you later. Have a All good right. one. See you.